And tonight at 6, we start with a question. Should someone facing an order of protection also lose access to their guns? It is a question the Supreme Court will try to answer soon. But in Tennessee, some question whether these orders really do enough to protect. Good evening to you. I'm Carrie Sharp. And I'm Rory Johnston. Our team is digging into some answers for you. News Channel 5 investigative reporter Levi Ismail took a closer look at these orders and why some say there's very little accountability for abusers. Victim advocates told us they don't want people to confuse the issue by making this about losing a constitutional right. They say law-abiding citizens shouldn't have to worry about losing access to firearms. It's those who have proven they're a threat that they believe need the accountability these orders should offer. Wilson County 911, where is your emergency? 911, what is the location of your emergency? He's here. The calls you hear were made seven months apart. Different cities, different people. There's a man trying to shoot a woman with a shotgun. The police just left from checking my house. Okay. But it's what happened back in 2021 Again, let me verify the address. that ends in an all too familiar way. Where has she been shot? Can you tell me? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Marie Varsos and Michaela Carter may not have known each other, but both suffered an almost identical fate gunned down near their homes by men they once trusted. We run into it consistently. Samantha Colloy survived her abuser, but says walking away is never easy, especially if guns are involved. My own abuser, after I, even after I had left, was texting me things like, my guns are clean and ready for you. I have a bullet with your name on it. Between Colloy and Lizzie Rice, they make up part of the prevention team at the Tennessee Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. They help victims plan their exit which sometimes requires an order of protection, and this, a firearms declaration meant to keep abusers and firearms separate. Just because we're taking or taking measures to keep people safe in some instances, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to impact their um, Second Amendment rights. But that's the argument now in front of our nation's highest court in U.S. versus Rahimi. The case boils down to the question, should someone facing an order of protection also lose access to their guns? Clearly they granted review in this case because they wanted to weigh in on the issue. News Channel 5 legal analyst Nick Leonardo has presided on these orders of protection cases in the past, but says his biggest concern is that there's virtually no follow-up with these declarations to make sure abusers don't have access to guns. But the problem is that there's no one checking up on this, okay? And so it's kind of a, a sort of a paper tiger. Absolutely, absolutely. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, we hear a lot of things like um, an order of protection is just a piece of paper, and especially to someone who's incredibly dangerous. I don't, you aren't letting me in our house, stop. Marie Varsos recorded this moment, hoping to show her husband's true colors. Fine, come on in. Come on in. I'm but calling the cops still. No, you're not. Moments later, she was choked unconscious and held at gunpoint. When she came to, Marie filed for an order of protection the next day. Michaela Carter did the same after she said her ex beat her with a whiskey bottle. Both men had orders demanding they give up access to their guns only to shoot and kill the same women who sought protection. There's no one who is checking. There's no one going behind. All you have to do is fill that form out. And so even though that law is there, it doesn't really have any teeth. A ProPublica report on domestic violence shootings in Nashville since 2007 found that of the 75 people killed, nearly 40% died at the hands of someone who was not legally allowed to have access to guns. The intent behind the law is a positive thing but you know if you filled it out and said I don't have firearms and the truth is is that you do there's no one who is checking if there's no one checking well then what's the point of having this be a component of the order of protection there's many holes in the law and that's something the General Assembly could take up declare it passed Massachusetts for example requires people who are served with an order of protection to immediately surrender their firearms to law enforcement without objection so ordered Clear Tennessee has no such policy in fact the only time law enforcement knows an abuser still has access to guns is if they're called to a home probation officers are involved or if someone commits a crime that hasn't stopped the Tennessee Firearms Association from writing a response to the Supreme Court challenge. They say these orders unfairly limit access to a constitutional right for someone who may not have been charged with a crime, 
That's because these orders are civil issues in Tennessee, which means someone can request an order of protection that forces another person to give up access to their guns, even if guns were never involved in a threat. Probably 20% or less of the orders of protection actually involve the use of firearms or the, or the threat of, of firearms. Second Amendment advocates have drawn parallels with red flag laws, but victim advocates say we shouldn't confuse the issue to keep lawmakers from better protecting victims. Any kind of gun regulation is seen as punitive. Like, in this case, it's not punitive, it's a safety measure. If these so victim protections are upheld, the question then becomes, what will Tennessee do to protect the thousands of victims who rely on these orders for protection? Leonardo says verifying access to firearms and creating a system won't be cheap. But considering what's at stake, some say we can't afford to do nothing. Lives are at stake. This is people's lives. Um, it's their safety, it's their well-being, but it is literally their, uh, their lives are in the, in the hands of these decision makers. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that they would hold that with the level of gravity that it deserves. With News Channel 5 Investigates, I'm Levi Ismail. Levi, thank you. Let's talk about some other safeguards. A law that goes into effect in just three weeks aims to help domestic violence survivors at least feel safer. It's named after these two women. Levi told us about uh, Marie Varsos and then also Debbie Sisko. The Debbie and Marie Domestic Violence Protection Act makes GPS monitoring a condition of bail for some people charged with domestic violence or aggravated stalking. A survivor's cell phone would be pinged if their alleged abuser is near them, and law enforcement must be made aware if someone violates their bail. Now that will go into law and it will go into effect coming up July 1st.